Well, today is National Poll Worker Recruitment Day. And as anyone watching this probably knows, poll workers really are a critical part of our elections. They're the face of the election office. They're the ones on the ground that are manning the polls and interacting with them to make sure they're checked in and they get the appropriate ballot and they, they understand that process once they get there. Having an adequate number of those pokers critical for election day to go smoothly uh, and that there to be no issues on election day um, for voters that may in negatively impact a voter. And so poll workers are not normally full-time uh, election workers or employees of the office. They're recruited. They're trained to assist temporarily uh, with the election period, at least most of them are. Um, that will include setting up the voting equipment and providing those ballots to voters and performing other functions that the state or locality needs. So to put this in perspective, when you add it all together, states, territories, and the District of Columbia, over 640,000 uh, election or poll workers work the 22 election, and that's just the in-person experience. Um, and we'll need about a million poll workers for 2024. That's similar to what we had in 2020. And that's a presidential election. There'll be 95,000 physical polling places. That's a lot of people in a lot of polling places. So it's a massive endeavor. And that's why uh, in 2020, uh, the US Election Assistance Commission, the EAC, um, started uh, National Poll Worker Recruitment Day. And it's really is an action to help localities, um, to, to help buttress their recruitment efforts at the local level, where, you know, based on the data that we had in the EVE survey, this is a survey we provided to the Congress, is that it's really a, a real problem, is that over 50% of localities reported that it's very or somewhat difficult to recruit pokers. And then the, another 25% felt that it was just neutral, that they had, you know, so, I mean, only only about 20% 20, uh, 20 felt that it was easy to recruit poll workers. So that's why we're here today to talk about strategies of poll workers, how important they are. Uh, and um, with that, we're gonna go to our first guest, uh, Chris Anderson, you are the supervisor of Simcoe County and uh, Kyle, uh, Kendall Cobb, welcome. Welcome to uh, the EAC and uh, discussion on poll workers. How, how are you today? Doing great, thank you for having us. Thank you. So it is National Poll Worker Recruitment Day and I wanna introduce you a little bit, uh, Chris, I, I know you very well, but some might not. Um, Seminole County's in Central Florida. Um, uh, Chris served as a, a veteran in law enforcement and the military, US Army to be uh, exact. He was appointed by Governor DeSantis for, uh, as a supervisor election um, in 2019 and has served since then. And so in 2022, his office was awarded an EAC Clearinghouse Award for informing voters uh, with Facebook voting alerts. And Chris, I think the, the, the first uh, thing I'd like to talk about is this, this program that you had. I, I heard a story from you and your, your team about how the voting alerts worked generally, but also in specific crisis that you had. Would you like to talk a little bit about that Cleary winner uh, function and how it served your office to recruit poll workers? Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And first, I'd like to take a moment to uh, thank the, the men and women of the Seminole County Supervisor of Elections Office for everything that they do day in and day out to ensure that uh, every choice counts here in, in Seminole County. And uh, in particularly Kendall Cobb, who is our uh, public information officer. Kendall spearheaded this, uh, this, this program. He worked very diligently to get us approved through Meta to be able to send out these alerts, which essentially gets information in front of voters who have Facebook accounts, uh, which is uh, several hundred thousands of uh, citizens here in, in Seminole County, critical elections information. And it was an incredible uh, program. And, you know, when we did the first Facebook alert, because um, I'm going to allow Kendall to explain the details of it, uh, Kendall said it was the best day of his life. So I want Kendall to explain exactly why it was the best day of his life. So Kendall, please take it away uh, and explain the best day of your life. Wow, well, Kendall. Best day, the, huh? All right. Go ahead. Uh, uh, <laughs> just a caveat. The, the best day of my life uh, mostly was because when we put out this voter alert, it was uh, halftime of the Tennessee-Alabama football game. And as a big volunteer, Tennessee ended up beating 
Alabama that night. And so, it, you know, overall, yes, one of <laughs> one of the greatest moments. I do have to mention I was married in 2022, so I'm going to take that as the best moment of my life, you know, just. <laughs> just we'll, we'll edit. Kendall, yeah. we're going to edit that portion <laughs> out of this, so go ahead. Stop digging. Yeah, so. With, with, with about the Facebook voter alert, so it was something like, as uh, Supervisor Anderson said, it was, it was a project uh, that I really first got looking into in 2021. Um, we were looking at Facebook ads to see what you know our options were, and that's where I came across uh, the alert feature. And so through a lot of research, a lot of coordinating back and forth, working with people from Meta, working with you know the you know Florida Division of State uh, Division of Elections Secretary of State's office, we were able to put together. Um, uh, you know, Zoom meetings and things like that with Meta so that we could all learn how to use Facebook voter alerts. And it's a great system. It's a free tool for, you know, government and municipalities, elections offices like us, to where we can get any type of information out to the, you know, the top of the Facebook page of every, you know, person who has an account in Seminole County. And, it, and the best part is it's free. We're not paying advertising money. This is a free tool for us to get information out there. And so it was, like I said, it was, um, we had about two weeks left um, before, you know, everything kind of started to close down that we needed for the elections. And we realized that we were running short on some of our election workers that we needed to fill some of the polls. And so that Saturday, uh, we decided to test out the Facebook voter alerts for the first time. It was our, you know, it was our guinea pig. And we were like, all right, we're going to drop a post it says you know essentially uh, we're we were uncle sam you know we need you you know to, to work the polls and uh we dropped that facebook voter alert and within a day we had you know, 300 applications you know in on our website we were able to fill the classes we had to create new classes to you know to fill the need that we that we got from from those voter alerts so it's it was an incredibly successful venture um it allowed us to not just you know attract election workers, but to inform our voters about, you know, election dates and times, early voting dates, closures happening after the hurricane came through and we had to close two polling locations. It was such a wonderful, wonderful tool for us to utilize. And we're looking forward to continue to use, utilize it. We're helping other counties here in Florida get through the process of getting their, you know, approval so that they can shoot out voter alerts as well. So it's, it, it's been, it's been incredible. Yeah. And, and Don, to follow up a little bit, you know, Hurricane Irma, it uh, struck Florida September 10th, and the devastation that occurred uh, throughout the state, uh, as you know, was 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 massive. And in Seminole County, uh, most people don't know that the St. Johns River actually flows north. It's one of the only rivers in the country that, flow, that flows north. Well, that caused severe flooding in Seminole County, which caused some of our election workers to be unavailable to actually work. I will tell you, let me just speak to how dedicated election workers are, because they are very near and dear to my heart. I make sure that I'm primarily the primary trainer for all of our election workers. We have about 26, 2700 that we have to train. Um, we had some election workers that were living in trailers and their homes were completely surrounded by water and they still showed up to train. Now, let's be clear. The amount of money that a person is paid to serve as an election worker is not something that's going to um, allow you to go take a vacation in in uh, in Hawaii or something like that, right? It's it's a very minimal amount, um, and, and I know election workers they do it because they care about the democracy and they understand that they're stewards of it and they want to protect it. Uh, they showed up even still, but some just couldn't. Their houses were underwater completely. And, you know, that's why when we sent out that alert, it was so critical because there is no way that we can service 337,000 voters uh, with a staff of uh, 20 individuals uh, and maybe 20 other seasonal individuals. There's no way we can do it. That's how critical election workers are to any elections office in the United States of America. We need them Im immensely. So that Facebook alert, uh, as we, we jokingly said, was one of the best days of our lives was because we knew how mission critical things were in September when early voting is getting ready to start in mid-October. Uh, and we now are uh, with, without uh, election workers. So it was it was a, a huge game changer for us 
uh, in in recruitment. Well, you know, this this story, I mean, it confirms to me at least that I'm of the belief that we had some shortages in 2020, but when we let when we got the word out and Americans knew that there was a need, they showed up and they really responded to it. And I think that's that's an example that we have in Seminole County where you know, there's a number of polling places and poll workers that we just, just just not enough because of the, the the hurricane and the impact of that. Yet when Americans heard of the need, there were other citizens in Seminole County that stood up and said, "We're gonna we're gonna perform this this duty." So that's why we do this. That's why other is trying to just amplify that message that now is the time to get involved. Now is the time to volunteer and to be a poll worker. So we don't have these shortages across the country. We don't have offices saying it's very difficult to recruit. So uh, Supervisor uh, Anderson, let, let's, uh, you you mentioned your mission statement. I, I really, uh, ensuring your, your uh, choice counts. Um, tell us how you came up with that and how election workers reinforce that mission. Well, you know, it's my philosophy as a leader to, to make sure that we have a mission statement that is first uh, un- clearly defined and it encapsulates uh, uh, everything that we do uh, down to, uh, to, and it it is pointing toward the voter. And ensuring your choice counts is what we do. Uh, At the end of all of our work, the bottom line is we are trying to make sure that we uh, are taking uh, the ballot that is cast and whatever is on that ballot, and we are ensuring that it is properly tabulated and counted toward uh, the direction that voters want to see their government on the both the local, state, and federal level. And um, you know there is some science to it. You know uh, the most successful companies have mission statements that are four words or less. So I didn't want it to be uh, cumbersome as I formulated a new approach to elections. Um, I wanted it to be something that could be uh, weaved into the fabric of the organization. Uh, One of the things I did upon taking office is I asked uh, uh, employees uh, what the mission statement was prior to, and they didn't know. And that wasn't a dig on them. That was simply saying that I know from having served in other organizations, when mission statements are too long and too hard to to digest, that it, it's a difficulty in uh, trying to understand the purpose. So I wanted to keep it short and clear. And you know, I often will walk around and ask, you know, hey, what's the mission statement? Okay. And you know, it's so cool to see election workers; they know it. And they weave it into what they say. You know, when I'm training the election workers, because I like to be as animated as possible because they're giving us our time. I will say, you know, when you're dealing with a voter, you know, and they have a question, you know, one of the things we always start with is, okay, well, sir, ma'am, to ensure your choice counts, let's make sure that we get the correct information to make sure we give you the correct ballot. I wanted a, a mission statement that, created massive amounts of buy-in and and it really it 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 makes me feel so good when i hear it uh and you know i've heard other elected officials use it other colleagues and you know it as they joke one thing i always say is but you remember it and it it's in the fabric of our organization and it it's uh it it, it it's it, it's a team building, you know, exercise all the way through. Um, I just, you know, I wanted to to make sure that it was something that was rememberable and in in uh, it made an impact. And I can tell you, my that my election workers, they definitely got it. My this full time staff here, the seasonal, they all know it, and it's uh, it's cool. Well. The big question is, is have you trademarked it? Because we might have to steal that <laughs> here at DAC. We might have to, uh, we have to steal that mission statement. That's a really good one. Uh, we're all like, on the same team here. And all right. All right. That's good. Yeah, whatever works. You know, if you can, if if we can just get people to understand that, listen, this is, this is really what it's all about. You know, we work tirelessly and, you know, from the collection of ballots to sitting down and, you know, checking the, 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 the uh, checklist to verifying all the materials that are in, in bags that go out uh, from our, our logistics matter, you know, from operations to compliance to voter services to 
information technology and security. Everything we do here is to make sure that the choice that you make is a choice that we take. Well, that's that's great. What are you, I, before I let you go? We we have to go to uh, we're going to move on to another state or uh, another county. What 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 is your office doing for National Public Recruitment Team? What what do you normally do uh, to engage the public? Kendall, I'll let you answer. All right. Yeah. So uh, you know, this year we're going to be you know, obviously we already got some social media posts already up and and planned for you know later in the day. We're uh, we're going to be reaching out to our previous, uh, you know, election workers today. We're, you know, we're starting the process of getting them in and start thinking about 2024. Um, we're also one of the things that we're going to be, you know, uh, shooting out this year, which is something that we have uh, borrowed from some of our other counties uh, here in Florida. Is we have these little business cards here that say, you know, you're an awesome, become an election worker today. And on the back here, it's got some great information, you know, and, and, and a, a, a QR code that takes them straight to the application. And so, we're going to be handing these out to our clerks, um, you know, and our staff here. And when we see people out, uh, you know, out in the public that we, you know, see that they do something awesome, we're like, that's a great quality that we know that our election workers have. We're going to be handing out these cards to kind of pass them out and see if we can't uh, recruit some people on the ground that way as well. Thank you, Supervisor Anderson, Kendall Cobb. Thank you for joining us. Talk about Seminole County. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for uh, recognizing National Public Worker Recruitment Day. Thank you for having us very Thanks, much. Don. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. No take problem. care. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. So our next guest is, is um, we're going to ask Greg Clark to join us from Duval County, the Big D from uh, north north uh, east Florida, uh, Big Duval County, home of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Greg, are, are you with us? I am with you, Don. It's great to be with you, and uh, it was great to hear Supervisor Anderson and, and Kendall. There's some some fantastic work being done by the local jurisdictions in Florida, might I say, but across the country. Oh, that's great. Well, let me introduce you to uh, let me introduce you to our audience. Um, uh, Greg Clark is the Director of Election Education Outreach and Public Recruitment for the Duval County Supervisor of Elections Office. For those that aren't are aware Duval County is basically the Jacksonville area and some of the uh, um, the environment. Um, Greg amplified his office's voter education message by he's created innovative partnerships with local professional and minor league sports teams as well as college institutions in the Jacksonville area. Um, and that got my attention because obviously I, I'm a Jacksonville graduate of, of higher higher education. By utilizing the power of social media, he grew uh, the social media contact from 4,000 to 1.2 million, helping us earn his office a 2022 Clearinghouse Award, EAC Clearinghouse Award for Innovative Strategies and in Voter Education, Messaging, and Poll Worker Recruitment. That's a mouthful, but the bottom line is he has to get the job done by recruiting enough poll workers and getting them trained. So the big question I have for you, uh, Greg, and welcome aboard. Thank you is how did you get your foot in the door from any of these athletic and other institutions in the Jacksonville area? How were you able to sell um, the program, um, for example, of recruiting poll workers and, and basic voter education? Well, uh, I think you've hit right on the nose. Sell is part of the word, right? Um, you know, we're, we've, we've got a message that we're uh, that we have to communicate to the public. And if we want to get uh, community organizations involved, we have to sell it in a way that it works for them. Um, you know, if I was to take just a, a, a half a step back, you know, it's about looking at, at the organizations in your community that have not only significant community impact, but perhaps let's say, uh, let's say true immersion into the fabric of the local community. And so in Duval County in Jacksonville, we certainly recognized uh, that our sports franchises, our collegiate institutions have that. Um, today, mostly we'll focus on the Jacksonville Iceman, which is in hockey, uh, the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp, which is AAA baseball, and the Jacksonville Sharks, which is indoor arena football. Uh, you know, then we really just reached out with a phone call because we can all do that, right? We're used to doing that. We're the supervisor of elections. You know, they should want to talk to us. Uh, I think we all come from that mindset, and they do. But the, the question is, how can we get their full buy-in? 
because you know we can always ask and get this much, but how can we get this much? And that's kind of what we're talking about a little bit today. Oh, outstanding. Um, were there any, you know, you talked about sort of um, how you reached out to them. Were there any key words or phrases that worked? Um, was it the message on poll workers or was it just general civic engagement that the sports team are sort of interested in? Or... Well, I, th I think civic engagement is there. Certainly nonpartisanship. That's a, that's a phrase we're all very familiar with, right? right. Um, because these types of, of uh, community sports teams, uh, well, it's very important to them to be nonpartisan too. You know, they, they cannot right. alienate one side or the other of their fan base. But more importantly, I think I'd say when we're going in and trying to sell a message, we need to think about branding, uh, specifically when you're talking about sports, but you could be even talking about charities and ownership. You know, how can we allow them to brand it to, to their messaging, how they like to be seen in the community and then be able to take ownership? So uh, that's the key. And you'll see that a little bit here shortly. I think we may even have some things come up on the screen, possibly uh, on how we spoke with them. So do we have that, um, Kristen, I'm not sure, do we have that available to, or, or Heather to, to show some of the uh, messaging? Well, I can talk through it very easily. So um, uh, what we did, and this, let's, I guess what, we want to transition specifically to National Poll Worker Recruitment Day, right? Um, what we did was we went into the three teams that I spoke of, the Iceman, uh, the Sharks, and the Shrimp. By the way, they have about three, over 300,000 uh, friends that follow them on social media, uh, where our Duval County, you mentioned it at the top, uh, we get to about 4,000. And that's pretty good for an elections office. So uh, what we did was we went in and we said, hey, let's all create what I call a social media postcard. Uh, let's allow them to brand it to their look, uh, to, to their image. Uh, so for the Iceman, when we came in with a theme, we gave them suggested themes. With the Iceman, we said, um, score a hat trick and serve as a poll worker. Well, if you're not that familiar with hockey, that's a big thing in hockey. You, you score one player scores three goals in a game and they get a hat trick and all the fans throw their hats on the, on the ice. But uh, in baseball, I think people more familiar across the board, uh, you know, hit a grand slam and uh, serve as a poll worker. Uh, in, in football, the theme with the, with the Sharks was score a touchdown and serve as a poll worker. So that, that allowed them to basically create arc work that fits with the branding of how they traditionally position their team in social media. Uh, and it also communicated a message that, that got the fans' attention. Uh, we weren't just saying, hey, here's a press release. Hey, here's a little bit of thing that we put together with artwork but it doesn't really fit your artwork, right? Just, just push our message out because we're the supervisor of elections office. So we basically try to get buy-in by making them feel that they're partners by giving them ownership of the message. Uh, one of the key things to think about here is we want it to be branded and unique to them. That's what gets them excited about participating. Um, but of course, important to us is uh, we want them to be uh, we want it to be consistent to our message, right? Now, something that just popped up on the screen is a little bit beyond what we're talking about with the postcards, but this has gone, some of the things we've done with the sports teams has gone well beyond. This is Jacksonville Iceman. We actually got them to play a couple of games in custom hockey register to vote jerseys. Um, my understanding from talking to everybody I can think of in sports at the time that we did this, this had never been done in minor league sports. And I don't believe it had ever been done by any sports or any election jurisdiction in the country. It got substantial coverage in the local media. And the great thing was at the end of the game, they auctioned the jerseys off and they raised $30,000 for the Jacksonville Iceman Foundation. This was later mirrored. He may even be later today uh, by a good friend of mine up in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, he picked up on this. Uh, Isaac Kramer and I met when we were doing some Sarah training nationally. Uh, and so Isaac's doing some exciting stuff up in Charleston as well. This is something else that's popped up on the board now. This kind of gets a little bit into what we've done uh, to maximize buy-in uh, with the, some of the sports teams for uh, poll worker recruitment. Uh, this gives you a little bit of a layout of how it's designed, but we basically went to them and we said, you know, we didn't just say, hey, we want you to help us recruit poll workers. How can we set it up in a way that it's beneficial to you? And so also, so you get something out of it, right? And so what we allowed them to do 
was to create a, I would call it a game experience package where the fan could get something they couldn't normally get that really didn't cost the Iceman hardly any money at all. And then what we did was we flipped that back and we gave our poll workers an opportunity because they're a 501c3 charity to donate their poll worker pay. Um, and so in this particular first run, we recruited 38 poll workers. We raised $8,550 for their foundation. Um, we got great poll workers. They were a little bit younger than the average poll worker, although all ages are great, right? Uh, they were a little more computer savvy. They were good with the public. Um, and by packaging it this way, they, they had full buy-in with the Iceman and, and pushed hard to get their message out on social media for us. I don't know if they've got the uh, postcards, but uh, uh, if they get a chance to post those up. But uh, the, the National Poll Worker Recruitment Day, uh, they pushed out to over 300,000 this morning. A uh, couple of things have happened because of that. Because of who they are, we're getting considerable uh, media requests for interviews. Uh, that we wouldn't normally get just because we're the supervisor of elections. Just this morning, our mayor's office uh, got on full board and uh, city of Jacksonville social media is pushing hard uh, for us uh, with, this, with this type of messaging. Again, because it's a community immersed in the fabric of the community. There we go. Fantastic. Um, and, uh, and just some fantastic good things are coming out of it. Um, and, and, the neat thing about this is once you build these connections with these sports teams, or even if you were to go into charities, you know, if you went with the Heart Association, it'd be instead of hit a grand slam, it might be something like, you know, serving as a poll worker is good for the heart, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're giving them an excitement factor to get involved. You're speaking to their fan base. Uh, and a good thing I can tell you is as of about 30 minutes ago, we already had 40 new poll worker applications today. Uh, to our landing page on our website. 40. Oh my. Yeah. I mean, that's the day's young too. The, yeah, day's, the day's young. And a lot of these things are just hitting the, uh, they're just hitting sort of the, uh, the newspapers and the, in the media. Correct. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be out there for a while, but this is great. Um, you know, I guess one of the questions I've asked folks is what are you doing on national public recruitment day? It's almost like national public recruitment week. Um, it, it is it's sort of leading up to this day today. Um, and I think that Duval is going to feel the effect of this for, for days and weeks to come. Would you agree? Yeah, and we're certainly looking hard at our Google Analytics, if you want to call it that. And, uh, you know, what happened last week, what's happening today, what's happening today and over the next seven days. So we'll be looking very hard at that. In, in addition, of course, you know, if there's an ultimate scorecard, it might be who, how many poll worker applications do we get filled out, right? Yeah. But, uh, but this certainly gets people talking about elections talking about being a poll worker. Um, and we're, we're quite excited about it. Well, I'm, you know, I'm going to let you go, but I, I, I uh, the, the big question I have for you is you also train poll workers. So you are the recipient of these, uh, of these applications and you would train those that are selected. Um, do you think this is a type of beneficial to your office and to other election offices to have, something like this that recruits pokers from uh, from the population oh i think i think undoubtedly so um you know i think we're all faced with a little bit of a challenge we had a huge challenge right when we went through covid mm -hmm. uh, things have recovered to some extent but i think we're all looking for if, if we could find a source for five to ten percent more poll workers mm -hmm. um that would solve so many problems right and especially quality poll workers, right? Quality poll workers that have the skills that we need uh, that are immersed in the community. And uh, that's who these sports teams, or if you were to lean into, so let's say some of the charities, they're already philanthropically involved. Uh, a lot of this, you know, you don't have to have a minor league sports team, by the way, to do this. You can do this with your local collegiate institutions. Uh, we've also done messaging that pushed through Duval County Public High Schools. And we've got a little bit of a template where we're thinking about down the road trying to try something similar to this, where people can donate back to the school system that will suddenly uh, be a juggernaut of a, uh, to get parents involved. And, and you know, let's, uh, let's get the elections where we need it and, uh, uh, you know, make sure we've got the poll workers to serve the public.
Thank you, Greg Clark, for joining us. He's the Director of Education Outreach and Poll Worker Recruitment for Duval County, uh, Supervisor of Elections Office. Thank you, Greg, for being with us. Appreciate it. Thank you, Don. Appreciate the invitation today and great right. work by the EAC. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. So we are going to move up north. Uh, our next guest is be Michael Dickerson from Mecklenburg County. Mr. Dickerson, welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me, Commissioner Palmer. Great to be here. It's great. L let me introduce you. Um, so for 25 years, uh, Michael Dickerson has served as the Mecklenburg County North Carolina Board of, Board of uh, Elections Director. Prior to his time as a local election official, he worked for our sister agency, the Federal Election Commission, as a deputy assistant staff director and continues to be involved at the federal level as a member of the EAC Standards Board. Um, I wanna welcome you aboard, then thank you for your service to the EAC, by the way. Oh, thank, thank you for having me on the board. I, 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 I enjoy it meeting the, the, the colleagues that I have over the past few years around the country. It's just invaluable to me. I, I, I look out and see the elections in America are in great hands. Uh, with all the uh, the professionals that I have seen throughout the uh, country. And here in Mecklenburg County, uh, which if anybody doesn't know, it's uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, Got to put out a, uh, you know, sort of a push for the Panthers since uh, Don was doing so much of it. Uh, the Panthers, uh, the Hornets, the Knights, uh, all of our, our, our Major League Soccer team, uh, Charlotte FC, got to put out a push for those since uh, he was able to push it and, and, and stress the sort of a similar situation where uh, when back during COVID, we were so fortunate to have these organizations, uh, uh, just as Duval County was talking about, these organizations get involved in the elections process. They, uh, in 2020, they opened their doors to us and said, come vote here. Come vote early here at our uh, Bank of America Stadium or at our uh, Spectrum Center for the, the Hornets. Even our, our, our minor league hockey team opened up its doors and said, uh, you can, can vote here. Everybody realizes the importance of the election process. And uh, to that, uh, as a director, I'm eternally grateful to all of our, uh, all of those people that help us out. So over the 25 years, how many poll workers do you think uh, you've trained and, and, and what are you, you know, some of the best methods that you feel in recruiting poll workers? Uh, thanks for making me feel a little older. Um, <laughs> that uh, uh, I looked at that. Uh, and if I think about 6,000 people a year is uh, what our team has trained. We're, we're over 150,000 people uh, over the last 20,000 or uh, the 25 years that I've been director that we've trained. So it's, it's a, it's a tremendous number. Um, but what must be said is these are tremendous people. Uh, these are civic minded individuals uh, who, who come out and yes, they get a stipend uh, of a, of a check for the, for the day, but, but they, they work a 15, 16 hour day. They work the day before the election to set up. They spend a few hours in, in training each time. They do their recruitment of, of their folks. They're tremendous people that come out and get involved in this process. So uh, hats off to them. They deserve our support. Um, looking looking back as, you, as you, your question asked, the, the toughest part is, 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 is growing with each election. Uh, there's going to be something out there that's going to change. There's going to be something out there that will be different. So how do we tailor our training methods to those changes? Um, 2020 with COVID, how do we take the 6,000 people you want to train, how do you turn that around and make it online platform where, where they, can, they can train in, uh, online and we can assure the success of the election by using a method that none of us, uh, a platform that none of us had ever used before COVID. So uh, it's, it's a tremendous effort to see how our staff here, and I, I am very lucky, I have, have, have a great staff here, uh, a team that is dedicated to getting these elections out to people. Uh, my best bet would be stay alert to what the changes are, 
yeah. uh, and stay ad uh, keep everybody ad advised. And what we do as elections directors is make sure that we give all of those workers the tools they can to succeed. And if we can do that, if we can give those elections workers the tools to succeed, they're going to come back. And that makes our job so much easier. So you mentioned change and, and, and you know, you, you mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic, that situation. Um, you know, you might have more or less early voting, depending on your state. Um, that's a different type of poll worker that needs to be recruited. So what is the, how is the messaging changed? Where is it, is it still the same? You know, it's like, look, serve your community. We need you, uh, serve your democracy. Has the messaging changed or is just the environment changed and we have to, to work with that? A little bit of both. Uh, the environment's a big thing that we worry about because our message will be the same. Serve your community. This is this is your way of serving your community. You know, it's funny. Um, right after uh, the COVID outbreak, you know, 19 outbreak started in, in 2020, we had just completed a primary election. And the week after that, we finished the primary election, uh, we had the uh, uh, order to shut down for a couple of weeks and the state was going to do this and we were work from home and all of these things. Um, we polled our poll workers right after that and said, OK, we're trying to get this settled. How many of you are, on, are willing to come back? Mm -hmm. Over 87 percent said we'll be back in November. Don't worry about us. We will be back. This is the dedication that these people have to this process of, of serving. When you can see numbers like that uh, and, and folks like that, that, well, we wanna come back. We'll, we know you're gonna take care of us. You're gonna give us face masks, hand sanitizers, petitions, all of this sort of stuff so we can do our job and do it effectively. Then we will we will support you at the Mecklenburg County Board of Elections and make sure you, you, you get out there. The uh, state also, our, our state executive director, uh, uh, Bell, actually initiated a Democracy's Heroes program too, where a uh, great process where you could sign up for anywhere in the state and you could sign up to be a, a, an elections worker. Uh, and uh, it they would then filter them out to states and send it back to us. And it worked out well for us, hundreds and hundreds of folks um, that uh, we could add to our database. We keep a database of over about six, seven, 8,000 people that we can pull down from and use for each election. Okay, how many do we need for this election? We'll, we'll grab you here. Uh, it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job. And I have I have a uh, precinct operations team that literally spends most of their time recruiting and training workers just so we have everybody to go and be ready for an election. Because they know as well as we do, we're here to serve the public. Our job is to help you vote. Uh, just as Mr. Uh, Mr. Anderson, Supervisor Anderson said earlier, our job is to ensure you get the vote. Uh, we want to give you that right, make sure you're out there and able to, to vote your process. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's funny, you think about, uh, you think about things like technology, is that going to change things? Is, is it going to be tough? Uh, I think we, most of our poll workers are 60s and 70s, uh, and they're very dedicated. Uh, I've got one poll worker who I think she's 93 years old uh, mm -hmm. and she's first there and last to leave every time. Uh, and just you, you just you applaud the effort and, and the work that these people do. Uh, and when your your face can come into a polling place and see a person that you've seen for the last few years in there, you feel pretty good and pretty, pretty secure about the whole process. One of the things I found, you know, and I served in Florida and Virginia, particularly with the the poll workers, is that oftentimes there'll be a lot of poll watchers there, right? There'll be members of maybe even from the elections office itself sort of overseeing the process, but there'll be a lot of eyes on them doing their duties. And so, but they do it with a lot of grace and calm because, you know, even though there's eyes watching, it's like they're there to serve the public. And, and um, you know, I think the public can be reassured that there's going to be members of both of candidates and parties here to watch the process and including, you know, from the election office itself to make sure it's being run, you know, smoothly. Oh, and they all take pride in that. 
They yeah. all take pride. They all want to, to get that high score. They all want to make sure that we did it great for the office down there. And that, when you can get that from a, uh, from a worker, uh, when you can get that sort of reaction from somebody who's technically only working a day or two, that just, I mean, that, that fills me with, uh, with a happiness and, a, and a, a gratification that I say, you got the right person in there. That person really loves, but you've got to realize you've got to be able to support these people. Um, changes come in our election law all the time here in North Carolina. Uh, you've got to be able to give them the correct information. And we've, we've initiated a problem where uh, a process where we actually will send out uh, regional precinct coordinators where I'm given this person who's a, sort of an expert in the field, uh, 10 precincts to just drive around during the day and check in with them and say, Hey, we're, we're, I'm from the downtown office. Do you need anything? Can we help you with anything? Can we can we give you some extra uh, help with something? And just having somebody know that they can check in that makes you feel so much better. You're not out on an island, and and Dickerson hasn't stranded me here out at the corner of 85. I, I don't know where I'm at. I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to make sure that they uh, they are they are well trained and well supported for the whole time they're there. Michael Dickerson, the Director of Elections of Mecklenburg County, thank you for joining us here at the AC and as we recognize National Public Recruitment Day. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me and all the work you all do. Thank you, sir. All right. Our next guest uh, is going to be a special guest. Uh, Isaac Kramer, are you with us? Hey. I am here. Isaac Kramer, uh, waiting for baby. Um, that's what I understand. I am at the hospital right now. <laughs> so we'll have a National Poker Recruitment Day baby, perhaps, uh, depending on timing, I guess. That's right. So We're I'd like to introduce a <laughs> like new Isaac on Kramer. the way. <laughs> that's right. Introduce uh, Isaac Kramer, Executive Director of Charleston County, South Carolina Board of Elections. Um, you obviously have a reputation of innov innovatively serving voters. Your accomplishments include expanding absentee and mail-in options, a live chat service, and founding Your Vote, Our Veterans. As this innovative idea led to a 2022 Cleary Award for partnership at the polls. In addition to becoming a new dad, hopefully here very soon, um, you serve on the EAC Board of Advisors. Thank you for your service to the EAC. You're welcome. So I guess my question is to start with is, and thank you for doing this despite, uh, I know, pressing matters. Uh, how do you convince other departments, you know, in Charleston to work with you in the recruitment of poll workers and talk about some of the, uh, the things that you're doing for National Poker Recruitment Day? Yeah, I think it starts with building your story. And a lot of times as election officials, we kind of get in our zone and other county departments may not see what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's building that bridge, I think, between county government or city government. For us, it was just bridging a gap between our office and other uh, departments within the county and just building the story of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And what we found as really good messaging is that our county employees, when there's a hurricane, they respond and they're ready. And we kind of focused on election day being like a natural disaster event. It's the one day where all Charleston County, there's a polling location in every precinct in every part of, of from north, south, east, west, everybody's showing up to a location to cast their ballot. So this was seen as kind of like a natural disaster response. And through that county um, government employees responded a very positive way. They counted for almost 15% um, of our poll workers on election day. And it was a great incentive that we gave them to serve um, and called it day for democracy. So it wasn't just, hey, sign up to work. There's a purpose to what you're doing. And that was great for them. So uh, one of the things we did as well is just as a thank you to our uh, poll workers who served as county uh, officials, um, we kind of spotlighted them. The county administrator uh, gave them a lot of recognition. And at the same time, uh, we want a state award for this initiative. Uh, one of the things 
that hadn't really been thought of throughout the state of South Carolina. I know this is done in other jurisdictions, um, but other counties in the state hadn't done that initiative where they're using state funds that were already in elections and then kind of distributing that to uh, county employees and also to um, our adopt the polling location uh, partners. So it all really came together by building a story, um, telling that story over and over again, building the relationships. Um, and then what ended up happening was something really successful where over 95% of those who participated in Day for Democracy said, hey, we want to do that again. And we're very excited for it to continue on. So it sounds like it was all hands on deck for Charleston County. And that's always good to feel. It's good to feel that you're being supported by the other members of the county. Now, you mentioned, and I just want to tease this out a little bit. You mentioned adopt a precinct. Is that one of your programs where uh, members of the community can adopt a precinct? Could you talk about that just a little bit more? Yeah, so we kind of umbrella this under the term partnership at the polls. As you have highlighted, and all of my colleagues from across the country have said, you know, elections are people powered. You know, it's the one thing that we rely on people to run elections. Mm -hmm. And through that, we have to really hone in on that messaging because our partners are not just poll workers, they're also organizations who can help us in this effort. So adopting a polling location, we have nonprofits, uh, businesses who basically give their staff for that day, they get paid normal, and then they get um, the poll worker pay, and they pull that money together, and they give that back to the local community. So you're reinvesting funds that have already existed, um, and it goes right back into our local community. And we've, we raised over $10,000 in the first um, election of 2022, um, November, and doing that, it was really exciting for us. Um, it's something we really appreciated, um, the partners. So like Greg, who spoke earlier, one of our partners were the Stingrays hockey team. Um, and they actually used their jersey sales and they adopted a polling location and they invested that right back to what we call a free and fresh program at the Charleston County Libraries. Um, and it gave free, uh, free fresh uh, fruits and vegetables to anybody. They walk in um, and during a time after COVID um, where you know fundraising has gone down significantly in uh, the libraries, they were able to use that money for a really great cause. Um, and that, that was a win-win for the Stingrays, really good PR. Think about it, you know, you're not just serving in voters and elections, you're serving your local community. And we're looking at that, hey, you have an opportunity here to be seen by your partners um, in Charleston County, and it's a good initiative. It just, it sounds like a, a great way to amplify the message to a different community that may not be following the South Carolina or the Charleston County elections, uh, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing one thing I want to highlight with that too, you know, Greg touched on this and, you know, he and I are, uh, we met together at an election center conference and that's kind of where we really bonded over some ideas. Um, he's trying to steal one of my ideas. No, it's not called stealing, <laughs> it's called sharing. Um, we've actually done this with students um, already. The James Island Charter High School wrestling team, they were able to um, adopt a, a precinct and they adopted our office to help with all the unloading of our polling equipment that comes in. And they raised $3,000 for the wrestling team. And you know how many brownies and cookies and popcorn you have to sell to get that. So we see a really awesome opportunity here across Charleston County school districts with sport teams, the chess club, art club to easily raise money. Easy, I mean, it's one day of work. Um, and we already have through that a couple student groups and even um, colleges that want to partner with us because they're like, man, this is easy and we get to give back and you get to promote your local organization. So one of the uh, benefits you mentioned was voter confidence and um, that that, it, that you saw an increase with people outside the typical world of elections. Um, are there any other benefits that you that you see with the uh, community engagement? I mean, obviously raising money is awesome uh, for, for uh, good needs, but you know, voter confidence is important. What, what have you seen with these programs? I mean, voter confidence is number one. So you, we always like to say as election officials, you know, if you touch, you see, and you're mm -hmm. part of the process, you're going to trust the process. Um, but those community partners are now our, our mouthpiece within the community. They're talking about us. I mean, through the Adopt the Polling location, we had multiple other organizations immediately interested and jealous about what other agencies and departments and uh, nonprofits were doing. Um, and also what we got, you know, afterwards, we, we created this amazing like eight minute video 
um, highlighting some of our partners um, and their experience. And it really just highlighted like they got to understand the process and they were able to explain that to other people. Um, you know, we live elections, we breathe elections, we know the ins and outs of it, but not most people do. And this is a great opportunity to kind of have that message amplified throughout our community and getting people excited. So election day is seen as a day of service, not just to our voters, um, but it's now seen as a give back opportunity um, to organizations that do matter. And I'm like, I'm really excited for this program. It, 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 it represented a 20% uh, total poll worker, um, you know, of our total poll workers. And, you know, I, I like to tell the media and folks around here say, well, 20%, wouldn't you want 100%? I say, well, 20%, you're talking an extra one to two people per polling location. And that results to maybe a 45 minute line going down to 10 minutes. You got an extra check-in person, you got another person at the voting equipment. It just helps that process to be even more seamless. So it's a significant number when you break it down. Isaac Kramer, Executive Director, Charleston County, South Carolina. I want to thank you for this and taking the time on a day like this where you're at the hospital awaiting a new arrival to your family. Um, thank you for everything you're doing for National Polgar Recruitment Day and good luck with everything. Well, I appreciate being here and you know, I didn't want to miss this, you know, even though we're at the hospital, I really value the EAC and the work you all are doing um, and just look forward to that. Continue working together to make sure our elections are secure, free and fair. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac Kramer, for joining us. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's the, that's our guest for today. Um, obviously, I encourage you all to encourage your neighbors and your family to become poll workers in their communities. Um, National Poker Recruitment Day aims to address the critical shortage of poll workers that we have. Again, over 50% of all election offices are stating that it's difficult or somewhat difficult to recruit adequate number of poll workers. That's half of the election office. We need to do better. The only way we're gonna reach um, and reach people to serve is we get the word out because if they know about it, the American people will respond. And so do your part today with free and fair elections by getting the word out to recruit more poll workers for the election community. Thank you very much.